Welcome to the New Books Network. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to New Books and World Affairs, a podcast channel on the New Books Network. I'm Medha Prasanna, the host of the channel. Today, we'll be talking to Professor Philip Howard about his new book, Lie Machines, How to Save Democracy from Troll Armies, Deceitful Robots, Junk News Operations, and Political Operatives, published by Yale University Press. So who is Philip Howard? For those of you living under a rock, he is one of the former scholars on the subject of information sciences. In fact, Foreign Policy magazine named him a global thinker for pioneering the social science of fake news production. Currently, he is the director of the Oxford Internet Institute and a statutory professor of internet studies at Balliol College at the University of Oxford. Phil, welcome to the show. We're very lucky to have you. Thank you very much for having me, Meta. I think we should start by telling us a little bit about yourself. I think the budding scholars in the audience would be particularly interested in hearing about your relationships with your mentors and how different experiences led you to this book. What a fabulous starting question. I think there's there's always um, some thing there's always things that mentors do that um, push you in a direction and pull you in a direction or there's things they do that that you want to replicate and things you learn that you don't want to replicate. And I'd say um, a couple of a couple of mentors have been uh, pretty um, consistent about um, impressing upon me the the role of hard work and getting up early and doing a little writing every day. And then um, several of them were very generous in different ways. And ha- part of that generous generosity often involved making me promise to be generous to my students. So I've tried to pass. I try to do as much of that passing it along as possible. That's so interesting to hear. I think I think we're all looking for those perfect mentors as students. Um, <clears throat> coming to the subject of privacy laws and uh, cybersecurity, and none of this is new at all, but there isn't much academic consensus on it. Do you agree with that statement? And why do you think that is? Um, well, I do think that there's, uh, there's probably some good consensus that uh, the Privacy laws are not adequate and not doing enough to protect us. Um, I think where there may be some consent, uh, where, there, where there isn't some consensus is on whether we can do anything about it. And I'm sort of in the, I'm in the camp that would say that we're probably past the point of ever being able to recover our data. I think we've lost the privacy war at, at the moment. Um, and the best thing that we can do is try to ensure that we, as citizens, get to share in the wealth of data that's out there. And um, as many of, you, many of you will know, or instinctively or through your own research, the best data on public life is not in the Library of Congress or in the British Library. It's not a public resource. It's uh, in Silicon Valley. It's, it's held by a a small number of firms that hoard basically the data on our mm-hmm. attitudes and aspirations and our behaviors. And um, I think that the way forward or the, the way to get us to recover some of that value is to um, be able to distribute or share anonymized, of course, but sharing data is, is one of the, one of the solutions I think to the current predicament we're in. Mm-hmm. So, Professor, this is not the first book you've written on the subject. You've you've written nine, among them being uh, New Media Campaigns in the Managed Citizen, The Digital Origins of Dictatorship and Democracy, and Pax Technica. Uh, These seem to be on the same plane as the book we're talking about today. But you mention in the book that this book in particular is about the people and the teams behind it. Could you tell us how it fits into your larger arguments about the information space? and uh, how you think it contributes to the literature on it. Well, one of my one of my long-term arguments is that it no longer makes sense to study politics or society or international affairs without making room for the technology part of the story. And I'd even go further than that and say that information technologies increasingly are have a causal role in our predicaments and our problems and our solutions and our opportunities. And that's unusual for a social scientist because most social scientists uh, really privilege or only privilege political actors, social actors, or individuals as um, agents in change. 
right? Uh, something a problem only arises or goes away when when people do things, according to that perspective. But I I think that um, the the mobile phones these days they they moderate our our interaction with politics and young people develop their identities over over these little screens and and there's so much to public life that's mediated through information technology. Uh, I just don't think it makes sense to talk about modern politics without making room for uh, the media side, the technology side of a story. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think we all agree with you there, Professor. Um, in speaking of uh, everybody using these devices and everybody's identities being built by it, you go through great pains in the book, especially in the first chapter, to go through and define these terms, misinformation, disinformation, fake news, junk news, computational propaganda, what is a socio-technical system? And and it is new to most of us. Um, and how important do you think it is for the everyday citizen to really understand the differences? And um, if, it, if it is that important, how do you propose we go about trying to achieve the scale of media literacy in the world? One of the challenges we are facing now is that so much of the disinformation or misinformation has become extremely subtle, right? It's very difficult to detect. Sometimes it's sometimes these information operations are are not about planting fake news or false narratives or junk news. They're about um, simply promoting bad news, right? So not not things that are wrong, but over promoting, over hyping bad news. And it's difficult for a lot of people to tell the differences. I think for, for most people, the really important lesson is that before sharing, you really should read the stuff that you're passing along because because it travels. The reason the stuff travels over, over networks of family and friends is, is when people don't actually read it, uh, read the content, and, and don't think about things critically uh, before sharing with a large network. And until we until we can get into those kind of better information habits, I think we'll, we'll be stuck with junk news as a problem. Oh, yeah, Professor, I really like that idea of if simple strategies and habits that we need to um, socialize ourselves into. Um, mm-hmm. Can and- I, before, before we go on, I, I actually don't want to emphasize, I don't want to underemphasize mm-hmm. the role of the platforms in all this. So even though you and I as citizens should become more sensitive and critical as we review content and pass it along our social networks. It's still those social social media firms that serve up large amounts of misinformation and disinformation or malinformation. And and Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and all the other platforms actually do have a responsibility to uh, get that stuff off their platforms, especially if it's related to um, especially if it's related to COVID misinformation or political misinformation or the racist or sexist stuff that often, that often comes from, uh, from, uh, you know, within, within particular countries and the platforms have some duties there too. Absolutely. Um, this actually brings me to a question I was thinking of asking later, but it seems so much more relevant now by <clears throat> a Humphrey fellow at the American university, uh, professor Anatoly Murashchak. And he asks, can you please clarify your vision on necessity and the opportunity to ban widespread disinformation in social media for national security purposes, especially with regards to freedom of speech and rule of law principles? And I think this is especially this question is especially relevant, seeing as in the last couple of months, especially during the election and counting of the votes in the United States, that Twitter banned the president from its platform. So um, I think it's about like striking that balance and, and we're all asking uh, the question of what, what that actually looks like. Yeah, well, what is the balance? I think, uh, so I'll just answer from my point of view. I think there's a, safe, there's a safe set of issues where I think it's okay to ban content. Um, there are campaigns uh, here in the UK and Europe to try to get uh, young girls to move to Syria to become ISIS brides. And uh, we know where these campaigns come from. And uh, I think it would be okay to remove that content uh, at the source and prevent it from circulating, uh, circulating far. It's targeting, you know, targets young women it's, it's, or t- targets children. Um, and uh, 
there's a whole host of reasons why it, it would be fine to get rid of that content. Then there's a family of content that is fake news and or junk news, and it is um, involves political lies deci- designed to deceive. In the U.S. context, it, it often involves disinformation about the election itself, about where to vote or when to vote, and and it's often about trying to prevent minorities from showing up on election day, right? So it's voter disenfranchisement campaigning. And uh, I think that stuff is okay. It's, it's, it's up to the platforms to curtail that stuff. Um, I do also believe in jury systems. So I, it should be, it should be humans in the loop who make an evaluation over whether, whether something should be removed and, um, you know, things that are purposefully trying to get um, people to not vote or do not follow the, the normal guidelines for an election, um, that stuff can, can go too. There's also types of content that arise in moments of crisis, right? So when there's a shooting, yet another shooting in Colorado, there are there's always a window of, of uh, 24 hours where the rumors just fly, right? And, and people blame Islam or people blame um, new immigrants for, for the shooting before the facts actually emerge. And I think I do think it's it's uh, responsible for the platforms to have the ability to slow down, curtail you know, when when that kind of crisis is evolving in in uh, current events. Beyond that, uh, you know, there's a range of I guess unpopular opinions, and I don't think we want social media firms evaluating what's a, what's a good or correct opinion. I I do. I do think that there's um, scientific consensus around the, co- the the causes of COVID and the health protections we should be following to uh, try to minimize the spread of the disease, uh, the spread of the virus. And so I think it's it's incumbent upon social media platforms to act positively to encourage that stuff. You know, there's also consensus around climate change. It's it's not a hoax. It is happening. It is human induced, and uh, I do think it's it's reasonable to do positive things to promote the, the messaging around the science and and actual actual facts, right? Absolutely. Um, I think uh, you were saying. Th- I, th- I think it kind of uh, harks back to having like transparency when it comes to how what the process is like if you are censoring certain material on the internet by these platforms and because I don't think most of us really understand what that process looks like at all. And uh, the other thing that you said about the 24-hour gap um, kind of reminded me distinctly about the example you use in your book about, I think, Nemtsov, um, the political opposition leader in Russia and how the IRA was ready to go right after um, and uh, how that window is used to dissipate domestic public opinion where there might have been consensus there wouldn't be anymore. So, um, and it, kind of, it also reminded me of something Samuel Huntington once said, that a truly helpless society is one that is incapable of a revolution because there's not much consensus left. Um, do you think that that's applicable? Do you think that certain societies, at least for the time being, have already been rendered so by series of these disinformation campaigns that don't allow them to really band together the direct opposite of what democracy activists in during the Arab Spring tried to do? Mm-hmm. I think they're I think your instinct is right that that um, consensus building is so much harder when institutions are purposely built to prevent uh, agreement or to prevent a shared record of information or to prevent um, you know open and co- uh, open and even-handed conversations. If if our political institutions are are built to privilege certain people, then then they will. They will talk the most and most frequently, right? And th- their ideas will circulate the farthest and get the most credence. So one of the challenges for democracy is figuring out what the right, uh, for deliberative democracy anyway, is figuring out what the right balance is, what the good mechanisms are for um, getting getting opinion out there and, and creating a process whereby people can evaluate opinions uh, without constraints and make the recommendations and then have those recommendations acted on or implemented. 
And building it all, I mean, it's, it's, uh, there aren't very many, I was going to say, there's never been a perfect democracy. There aren't really even very, there's only a few good democracies, I think. Um, you know, people still have a lot of um, romantic ideas about Switzerland and how Switzerland works as a democracy. And some of the best democracy or the most democratic organizations are actually quite small, right? So they're not, they're not governments, they're unions or s- small civil society groups or purchasing collectives, purchasing cooperatives, right? There are, there are small townships in uh, Vermont. There are exercises in democracy that, that seem to be healthy and work well, but they do take a lot of work. And, um, you know, they're usually, they're usually small, right? They're not the large. And sometimes I wonder if the, the larger the country, the larger the unit, the, the less likely it is to have sustainable democratic processes. Ah, that's interesting. Yeah, I, 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 yeah, I do think we look at large countries as this monolith, but really they're they're tiny states doing their own thing, and which is why I think it's easy to manipulate them. Um, in coming back to the book and the lie machine that you describe, I, I was really curious about uh, some of the stuff you said about the production of these political lies. And I, I think you really hit the nail on the head when you said talked about creating non-existent trade-offs as a powerful tool and a hallmark of a good political lie, especially when it's coupled a little bit with the reasonable public sentiment, as you call it. Could you give us some examples uh, of these and observed consequences for our audience? Well, you know, the um, you're in the DC area, and of course, one of the best, uh, most well-known in, uh, incidents, misinformation incidents, is the involves PizzaGate and Hillary Clinton, and this created a uh, this this was the result of. It was an out. It was both an outcome and a sort of an input, right? It was the outcome of an extended rumor, a conspiracy storyline about um, uh, about the uh, leadership of the Democratic Party and child abuse in a basement of a pizzeria uh, in um, in D.C. and the, the by the end of it. It's not clear that the rumor went away, right? There was a, a poll just after the 2016 election, I think by the Pew Internet and American Life Project, that that found that um, there was still 15, 20% of the population that were was not quite sure what was going on in that pizzeria and that maybe there was something to it. Uh, those, those kinds of stories last a long time, especially if they're pegged to um, a, a racist or a sexist um, stereotype. Uh, they last... They can last for quite, for quite a long time. Um, the anti-vax movement might be another example of a movement that's lasted a very long time. That's just now got something new to to activate on, right? The COVID vaccinations, and uh, it's uh, it's brought out uh, it's brought out all sorts of interesting messages and additional conspiracies about five G cell towers and Bill Gates and. Um, uh, the government inoculating, trying to inject microchips into our arms. I mean, there's a, there's a whole bunch of different, different longstanding conspiracies that get wrapped up into this anti-vax message. Yeah, absolutely, Professor. Um, and I, I, given that your team at Oxford does this whole country by country extensive analysis, I was really curious um, about what overarching themes you you have observed so far and what are the are there some special characteristics of groups in these countries that are especially vulnerable to these political lies well that's an interesting question because um at, at i am at heart a comparativist and that means recognizing that some countries are more alike than others and and every country is unique in some ways so the, the misinformation and disinformation trends in the United States are uh, similar to those in in the UK, maybe, and a little less similar to those in Europe, but they're pretty different from Latin America or India, say, uh, India, Pakistan. And in, we've done some studies in uh, Mexico, Latin American countries, India, during major elections, and found that the real challenge there is is actually not so much Facebook as it is WhatsApp at the moment. And one of the research challenges for us is that 
both uh, I'm thinking specifically Mexico and India here. Both countries have a very large and complex media ecology with news outlets that are often tied to political parties. And it can be very difficult to to evaluate those news outlets as whether they're junk junk or not. Right? So in the U.S. or in countries with um, a long-standing uh, a long-standing culture of professional journalism, you can pretty much list the, the top 20, 25 professional news outlets that most people trust most of the time. And maybe you can debate what Fox News is up to or debate what uh, the Daily Mail is up to here in the UK. Um, but in Mexico, Latin America, India, there's a whole bunch of news sources that um, just are below the radar or they're not very large and they don't have an independent editorial policy and they don't employ professional journalists. It's difficult to know where they get their revenue from. And these these kinds of news producers, these kinds of content producers, put out a lot of stuff that ends up being shared on WhatsApp or um, other messaging, messaging and chat chat applications. And in both countries, actually, this is also true for um, for Ghana, Nigeria, and Kenya. The, the, there are many countries in which those kinds of um, rumors about uh, incidents that may or may not have happened actually result in in riots and uh, you know protests that turn bloody. They get they get they get big very quickly, um, and that's a that's an effect we don't usually see in the U.S. Once in a while, we see it. Uh, April six, uh, sorry, January six, certainly an incident like that. But uh, um, the rumor mills, the political rumors in many countries um, are, are much a much more regular feature of political culture. Yeah, uh, absolutely, Professor. I was thinking about India because um, I'm Indian, and it it uh, this is definitely a recurring issue that we have in India that especially because of the many, many languages and at, at, at like a sub-regional level, it's so difficult to monitor the, the many news outlets and uh, the informal sources of news that the local people really trust and have been trusting for a while, but there's no way to really monitor them. To do so. that, yeah, to do that kind of verification. And as you said earlier, the, even big countries, big countries have little states and little provinces, and India is huge, and running an election is an incredible logistical exercise. And some states are wealthy, and some states are poor, and some states you know, up in the Northeast are touch on the border with China and uh, have their own, um, their own issues. And Kashmir is a difficult, you know, has been a a politically sensitive area for 50 years now. So there's, there's every, every part of India has uh, a complex political and um, a conflict, usually a con- complex conflict history. There's also the dynamics of caste that, that sometimes make a difference um, in terms of who is reading what. So it's, it's very complex in the Indian context. And when you overlay a platform that a social media platform that lets people uh, just talk with their own friends and family, you can sometimes see political rumors spread really quickly, right? uh, unverified stuff, stuff that the people don't read before before forwarding. Yeah, uh, what do you what would, in in the context uh, because we've on the international fo- I, forum, I think we give a lot of attention to Facebook, like you said, but WhatsApp is really creating havoc in like so many other smaller. Um, and underdeveloped nation states. So what what would you say is more dangerous, like a public platform like Facebook or these gigantic groups on WhatsApp? Um, because at least I think we Facebook can be monitored. There can be somebody sitting behind a computer fl- looking at what's being flagged, but WhatsApp is just a free for all. Yeah. Well, I think the, so there's a couple of ways to answer that question. I think the first thing to note is, of course, is that Facebook owns WhatsApp, and you and I can probably discuss whether Facebook really does need to own WhatsApp or whether whether it should stand alone. And the reason that's that's an important thing to think about is that different firms take different levels of responsibility for the con- what goes on on their platform based on how much political attention they get. So Facebook um, 
started attending to the problem of misinformation right after 2016. They didn't do enough, and they didn't do it, and they didn't do the same stuff in each country. You know, they, ro- they rolled out one program in Canada, but didn't put it in Australia, and they rolled out something in Australia, and they didn't run it in the U.S. So they, they, they experimented, but didn't, do, didn't act comprehensively. WhatsApp has only recently started to uh, hire people to think about this stuff that goes on on their platform. And one of the things that research have, researchers have found is that um, on average, because WhatsApp groups are are usually small and involve friends and family they they are policed they are socialized there's socialization that happens so you don't tend to see the really nastiest of the nastiest of, of um, racist or sexist stuff or stuff involving um, porn or stuff involving um, uh, children that tends not to travel very far but if but if you do see it, you can create groups that are dedicated to it. So, so it's easier to create a group that completely flies under the re- radar and is only about that, that, that nasty stuff. And it's, it's very hard for the company to track. I think for the first few years, WhatsApp was rolling out in different countries around the world. The company insisted that, that these were private groups and that they could not be used to broadcast messages and then researchers found that a political party, the big political parties, would simply set up lots of small groups right? and effectively still broadcast content to lots of small groups. So, you know, the platforms themselves do learn as they go. Unfortunately, the platforms do learn as they go, and they, they don't always act and respond as quickly as they should. Yep, absolutely. Um, and uh, I think... I think that's an important lesson to take away from this that um, they do it, political pressure does matter at the end of the day, and that's why they're acting differently in different countries. Um, and uh, this this brings me to uh, the IRA because they're the Russia's IRA because, as you've noted, and as there is some academic consensus that they are um, the best at what they do and their information operations and they we we're only just beginning to understand how extensive it is and they're becoming bolder every day they're putting out ads in moscow saying we need creative persons to join our teams and uh, there's really no way to curtail that within uh russia but how do other states defend themselves without basically Mm -hmm. resorting to offensive tactics themselves well, this one is tough. Um, I mean, I think um, those of us who live in democracies wouldn't want to see our governments developing more capacity to run information operations uh, in, in other countries or, or our own. Um, I think I think Russia's, the, the Russian government's capacity for misinformation is quite large, but there is there's a, a new... Um, there's a new force out there, right, in China. The Chinese government in the last year, uh, maybe 15 months, since the protests in Hong Kong, the Chinese government has developed a real interest and capacity in messaging around um, Chinese politics in English and on platforms that you actually can't use in China. So we know these are information operations because most Chinese users would not encounter this content. This is, uh, and, and their, their strategy is stylistically different. So whereas the Russian strategy, government strategy for misinformation usually involves ac- uh, accounts with fake profiles that have been around for a long time, right? They, they've been carefully curated and there's a lot of there's flower pictures and, and soap opera stories and, and soccer scores, that kind of thing. And then, then one day they start, they wake up and start talking about politics. The Chinese strategy for misinformation is a little different. They will, they buy in bulk and they will suddenly overnight set up 10,000 fake accounts and the accounts won't have pictures and, the, the, and they won't use names, they'll use numbers. And you or I looking at these accounts would, would know that they're highly automated. Um, but for a few days until they're caught and taken down uh, at scale, you know, with 10,000 fake accounts, you actually can 
um, you can get a political message out uh, to cross a barrier into to human human content networks. Uh, it's a much more hi- highly automated sort of bulk strategy of misinformation than than the Russians' style of, of misinformation. It's interesting that you brought up China because um, I was having a conversation with my professor on cybersecurity, and she she had an interesting thing to say about it. She said that. China has the capacity to to do these mass information campaigns, but they choose not to, or have not been doing as much as, uh, are not been doing it to their full capacity, at least in the last two years, or since maybe 2016. They, and uh, their priorities have changed. Do, do you agree with that? I think they have started to do it on a couple of key issues. Uh, like I said, over the last uh, year, a little more than a year, they've been active on Hong Kong, trying to get the world um, to think of the Hong Kong-based democracy advocates as thugs and rioters. Then they were active when President Trump was trying to get the world to refer to COVID as the Wuhan virus. Um, there were additional sort of resources put into trying to stop stop that happening and then more recently there's there's a broad range of um there's some general themes that have emerged out of chinese state-backed misinformation on covid the first general theme is that um our elected leaders democracies can't can't make the tough decisions that are needed for to manage the crisis that they they're too weak in the face of covid and they won't be responsive enough so the first message is that Democracies are, um, can't help us. The second message is that the Chinese scientists are leading in the research. So it's in the Chinese vaccine is the better vaccine, and the Chinese medical researchers will get there first with a um, you know permanent long term solution. So they're leading on the science. The third overall theme is that the Chinese government, the Russians do this too with to some degree. The Chinese government is leading on the aid, so they're helping more poor countries um, sending ventilators, uh, sending supplies. Um, and those are the three broad themes now around Chinese misinformation on government misinformation on COVID. Uh, fascinating. Um, and so would you say that the main difference between Russian misinformation and Chinese misinformation campaigns, at least right now, is that Russia in their tactics is much more consistent in a way where they produce alternative news stories and facts for all the, the smaller stories as well, where China is a way more selective and prioritizes mm. with stories. I think that I think that sounds right. I think the um, for a long time the Russian government strategy has been about undermining our confidence in our institutions, right? How we run an election or journalism, undermining our confidence in in legislatures china is china cares what china cares what we think about hong kong they care they seem to care what we think about uh, Xinjiang, the the treatment of um, muslims Uyghurs in the in the northwest they are definitely interested in in what we think about the south china sea and sea and who's who controls which parts of the the waterway i think they also engage with India around the um, security crisis, the border border shootings, the border conflicts that are happening there. So yes, you're probably right. It's a narrower range of issues, and it's um, a fairly specific, yeah, fairly specific range of issues. Mm-hmm. Um, shifting tracks just a little bit because um, I, I must ask this, and I think. Uh, I don't know if I completely understand it. So if you could clarify, what is this doomsday scenario of the Internet of Things and floods of personal data um, kind of look like? Like what, what is the timeline and what can we do? Well, I would say the timeline is um, five, five to ten years. Um, and for me, the doomsday scenario is is a scenario in which the data that we, the behavioral data that we leave behind with our mobile phones and our smart TVs and our, our uh, 
or credit card purchases, all that stuff, ends up feeding machine learning algorithms that craft political messages to pitch back at us. So there is some behavioral research that suggests that women women respond well to men with a deep voice and men respond well to women with a high-pitched voice and um, people of a particular race or ethnicity respond well to contact contact by other people of the same race and same ethnicity. And so if I'm a, a lobbyist and I can afford to use AI to take your credit card records, produce a fake face that is someone you're you're likely to take seriously, um, just based on your demographics, and and give that fake face uh, a messaging, a, a political message that you're likely to respond to, um, then we'll have sort of a, a highly, highly automated form of politics, right? Where somebody with money would would pay the most to activate the most people, and usually these processes are best at getting getting um, getting protesters to say no. Right? They're very rarely used for constructive dialogue or approvals, um, saying positive things or talking about an exciting new policy option. <laughs> That's not what these campaigns are used for. They're used to to block or to say no or to, to cancel um, a major policy initiative. And uh, I think um, there's a few major countries in the world that don't have any legislation in place that would protect against this. Uh, the U.S. is one of them. India might be another. Um, but I do think I do think those techniques are on the horizon, and uh, I'm I'm worried about what they'll mean for for our democracies. That's uh, that's terrifying, and I'm hoping because you call yourself a positivist and optimist that you could tell us uh, how we can. And that's I think, but that's also what you call your last chapter. How can we future proof ourselves from right. this? Right. Well, one of the basic steps is to um, modernize our election campaign laws, right? All democracies have um, campaign rules about how much you can spend and uh, when you can do your political messaging and how you can, how you should uh, 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 reveal who paid for which ads, all that kind of stuff. And most democracies have these rules on the books, but have elections commissions or elections administrators who aren't well-funded or don't have the ability to fine um, or issue penalties, and, or, or they're, they're, they've been told not to work on social media. They only work on, on TV commercials, that kind of stuff. And so I think the, the first basic step is to properly equip our elections officials with the ability to issue fines, because some of the bad actors, you know, it's you and I have been talking about Russia and China, but it's it's not just foreign actors. It's our own politicians who pay for this stuff. And it's it's hard to imagine politicians voting for more fines on politicians. But if at all possible, we need to be able to punish a politician who who spends big money, spends big money on on this kind of narrow casting, narrow targeting. Um, They they need to be prevented from running for office again, or they need to be a find in, in, a, in an effective way that prevents them, that sends the right signal to other political consultants that they shouldn't shouldn't be ripping your data and, and sending you customized messages. So that's getting good rules in the books and, and making sure they're enforceable is the first big step. I think, and we talked about this a little earlier, the second big step is trying to, is figuring out how to make the data that exists with um, in Silicon Valley for a few private firms, how to make that accessible to journalists and researchers and civil society groups, right? Every, every civil society group now needs a, a data scientist of some kind um, to be able to play with play with the rich data that's out there. Um, if it's just lobbyists who have who have that that kind of expertise, then other political actors won't won't have the expertise. That's interesting um, because to me it's about like it sounds like it's about internet equity and uh, putting in work into what mechanisms go into achieving that equity and i, I think that's like a longer different discussion but uh the, incredibly interesting um i i wanted to ask you because i, I 
I'm so fascinated by your team at Oxford and what you do every day. Um, and you do talk about how you had to sign this non-disclosure agreement with the U.S. Senate um, to get that report about Russia in 2016. Um, how, what would you say in your day-to-day -day dealings um, are the main obstruction to research on internet anonymity, I mean, uh, in internet uh, transparency and privacy and all of these issues, and uh, especially because you deal with so many countries and so many different laws? Mm -hmm. Well, the main, I guess the main obstruction of the firms themselves right there, they, uh, they claim ownership over the data, or they claim to be its stewards for the people on the platforms, and they won't share with researchers. Uh, they won't. They don't make it easy to um, to study the platforms in a systematic way, and so it's it's probably the, the firms themselves. I think it's I think it's a problem because many social scientists have to go through. Uh, layers of ethics review right before they can launch a project and uh, to get funding from a from a public science agency you need to put in a good proposal it gets peer reviewed it sees it's it sees um it sees peer review uh, our research and our ethics guidelines are much better our standards are much higher than anything any facebook data scientist has ever had to go through within the context of that company so if a major researcher can get um, financial support from the National Science Foundation, and they pass the ethics um, ethics rules set by their university, and and you know, and these standards are high, then then they should have the ability to um, to analyze data on social media, a sample of it or an anonymized sample of it. Um, but uh, the platforms don't. There have been several small initiatives to try to share data, but they they haven't gotten off the ground. And uh, on the whole, the platforms are the major obstacle. We're nearing the end, so um, I, I the penultimate question, I guess, is you've written uh, this Wired article about encouraging policymakers and academics to work with journalists to achieve their goal of quashing disinformation. Can you explain this your latest argument to us? Yes, and this has been great. Thank you for thank you for asking about that recent piece. I think the um, sometimes academics get um, criticized if they work with journalists, and sometimes they get criticized if they don't work with journalists. Right? If their if their stuff isn't easily accessible, and uh, as a team, we've decided to do. Um, you know, support some documentarians as they make good document document uh, documentaries. They um, we occasionally uh, work with journalists on a story, sort of in real time. So if a journalist comes to us, they've got a chunk of data they don't really understand how to how to manipulate it. If it's if if we have the skill set and the time, we do help them to tell their story. And I think I, the, for me, the reason to do this is that it helps raise the quality of reporting about technology issues and i think it raises uh, public understanding of how all this stuff is is complex so i've greatly enjoyed working with journalists this you know there's different norms around how you protect your subjects there's different norms around editing and uh, voice in an article um, they work to dead to a serious deadlines right uh, we we tend to work to publication deadlines but those are those are weeks or months uh, or years away. Um, so the pressure, the time pressures are different. But um, you know, if you're if you're an academic, your primary audience is other researchers, other specialists. But if you want to have a public impact, uh, and if you want funding, most funders these days require that you demonstrate an impact. Um, that you're reaching policymakers and that you're uh, you're shifting public opinion. So to be a modern academic these days, I think means um, figuring out how to work well with journalists and and make the relationship uh, healthy, symbi symbiotic. Well, Professor, we've taken up a lot of your time, but I'd like to ask you one last question before we let you go. If I may, what are you working on right now? 
Thank you. I have I have two projects. The first involves studying COVID misinformation, and I talked a little about that earlier. Um, it uh, involves social media again and public understanding of the crisis and um, health guidelines. The second project involves studying how machine learning could be used constructively within government to improve public service, to uh, deliver public goods. I think there's a lot of uh, broad ethics guidelines out there, and I, we don't need another set of ethics guidelines for AI. Uh, so this project is about coming up with an action plan and some policy ideas for how to implement the, the AI that we have now. Uh Professor, that sounds like a fascinating project, and I look forward to reading it. Uh, I want to thank you so much for being on this show today. I think we all learned so much. Um, and take care. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Good day.